tracking North Korea's weapons, going after liberal judges, and the newest White House correspondent. We're not making propaganda, we're fairly reporting. The White House this evening pushed back on a Washington Post report that President Trump disclosed highly classified information from an ally in an Oval Office meeting with Russian officials last week. The story that came out tonight, as reported, is false. The president and the foreign minister reviewed a range of common threats to our two countries, including threats to civil aviation. At no time, at no time, were intelligence sources or methods discussed. And the president did not disclose any military operations that were not already publicly known. Two other senior officials who were present, including the Secretary of State, remember the meeting the same way and have said so. Their on-the-record accounts should outweigh those of anonymous sources. And I, I was in the room. It didn't happen. McMaster's deputy, Dina Powell, issued a flat denial. It should be noted that the president and his spokespeople have contradicted each other on numerous occasions. The Supreme Court has declined to review North Carolina's 2013 voting law. That means that an earlier ruling by the Fourth Circuit stands, which found that the law was racially discriminatory and targeted African Americans, quote, with almost surgical precision. The law imposed a voter ID requirement, cut a week of early voting, and eliminated same-day registration. Thousands of new cases of the ransomware cyber attack were reported today, largely in Asia. We have an additional concern that copycats, as we've seen in the past, will provide variants to this tool and continue to come after us. The initial attack Friday, the largest coordinated cyber attack ever, hit more than 150 countries and 200,000 victims, disrupting universities, hospitals, and businesses. The hackers used a vulnerability that was exposed in NSA documents leaked online last month. The United States has accused the Syrian government of building a crematorium near the Sednaya prison to secretly dispose of thousands of bodies. The regime is responsible for killing as many as 50 detainees per day. The U.S. said Bashar al-Assad's government carried out the killings with support from Russia and Iran. Palestinians across the West Bank and Gaza fought with Israeli security forces during protests on Nakba Day, which commemorates the hundreds of thousands of Palestinians who fled their homes during the founding of the State of Israel in 1948. Today, some carried keys symbolizing the houses their ancestors left behind. North Korea launched another ballistic missile this weekend, and today Pyongyang claimed it's a new kind of missile that can carry, quote, a heavy nuclear warhead. This was North Korea's 10th missile test so far in 2017, and experts have warned that a nuclear weapons test, which hasn't happened since last September, could be imminent. It's hard to know which of Kim Jong-un's boasts are true, but thanks to new satellite technology, analysts can now draw their own conclusions by studying the country's weapons of mass destruction program from afar. Ravi Samaya has more. This is a cluster of shoebox-sized satellites being launched into space early this year. They're the creation of Planet Labs, a startup in San Francisco. The satellites photograph the Earth's surface in its entirety once every 24 hours. Even North Korea, one of the most secretive nations on Earth, cannot hide. What are the challenges of, of miniaturizing a satellite to this point? One of the key things we had to work on is the radio flap. So this radio now, even though it's, it's one of the smallest in space, um, actually can beam down information faster than your home internet connection. The satellites collect terabytes of images every day. So this is a live view into planet's mission control system. Overlaying onto the Earth is kind of the live position of our many satellites we have in space right now. Tell me about the coverage of North Korea. Which of these satellites is going over and how often? So actually all of them pass over North Korea every 24 hours and all of them take a small part of the land area in North Korea. And then we take that and stitch it together to create a full coverage. Is it fair to say that if you're Kim Jong-un now there's nowhere to hide your missiles? Um, you could put them inside. 
North Korea knows it's being watched. The Center for Non-Proliferation Studies uses planet's imagery to track the country's nuclear weapons. It's a game of cat and mouse, conducted nearly entirely remotely. We started taking pictures of Kim Jong-un and identifying where he was. Uh, the North Koreans got really annoyed by that, and we could tell that because they started putting up barriers behind him, so we couldn't see where he was. But you learn these really fascinating little things, like we watched Kim Jong-un watch a missile test from a mountain. We were trying to figure out what mountain it was, and it turns out it was the Masik Pass ski resort in the summer. That is part of a pattern we've noticed, which is Kim Jong-un likes to watch missile tests from really posh places. To build a 3D model of North Korea's testing site, the center combined satellite imagery with seismic data. They found that this facility fits perfectly with publicly available nuclear testing data released by the United States. It seems Pyongyang has used these declassified papers to replicate the American program. If you look in the goggles, okay. what you're going to see is a three-dimensional map of North Korea's nuclear test site. And am I looking at a tunnel? Yes, so there are a variety of tunnels that are going into the mountain. Using commercial satellite images, we can see the North Koreans digging them. One thing a model like this allows you to do is see what the biggest possible explosion they could conduct is. And we think that's sort of about 350 kilotons, which is 10, 20 times larger than the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. Uh, we can see based on the tunnels that they're building and the tunnels that they've used that they plan to conduct a lot of nuclear tests. And so it's this kind of just weird, disconnected chunk of a distant nation. You kind of get a sense of what it would be like, I guess, to fly over it in a plane. Jeffrey, I'm guessing you can't do that. Not unless you want to get shot down. We can see more of North Korea than ever before, including its nuclear program. But more information is not more knowledge. A lot of the rhetoric in, in recent weeks around these nuclear tests has sort of approached a feeling of certainty. Do you think that level of certainty is, is fair or accurate? No. There's an enormous enthusiasm when you get all of this data, right? You feel like, oh, I have all of this data. There are all these things I know. Uh, but you don't, right? This data is all indirect. And what you have is a series of clues. And, you know, it would be great if life was like a Sherlock Holmes story and you always got the answer, but often you don't. My guess is North Korea will probably conduct one or two nuclear tests there every year for the foreseeable future. That tells you the site's active. It doesn't tell you that a test is going to happen tomorrow. President Trump's travel ban was back in court today, with cameras rolling live. The Ninth Circuit Court's decision to allow the proceedings to be broadcast was unusual, but the questions the three Clinton-era judges on the panel asked repeated some familiar themes, mainly whether the statements Trump made on the campaign trail about banning all Muslims from entering the U.S. should be interpreted as the order's real intent. The important point is if you don't say all these things, you never wind up with an executive order like this. That's why context matters. It always has in the, conte in the context of the Establishment Clause. And here, the history is overwhelming. When the Ninth Circuit heard similar arguments about the first travel ban, they sided against Trump. Trump responded by questioning their motives which has revived a long-simmering Republican campaign to break up the Ninth Circuit, which they claim is biased toward the left. Alexandra Jaffe explains. When Donald Trump doesn't get his way in court, he likes to talk smack about judges. This new order was tailored to the dictates of the Ninth Circuit's, in my opinion, flawed ruling. This is, in the opinion of many, an unprecedented judicial overreach. And now, because some of his key executive orders are tied up in one court, he wants to completely dismantle it. To understand why, you have to understand a bit about how the federal court system works. The courts of appeals are the second level in the system, above district courts but below the Supreme Court. They're organized into 12 regional circuits, and the Ninth Circuit is the nation's largest by multiple measures. It covers nine states and two territories, 15 federal court districts, and about 20% of the nation's population. It has 25 active judges and four vacancies waiting to be filled. 18 of the 25, more than 70%, were appointed by Democrats, making it one of the more Democratic-leaning courts in the nation. And those judges come from some of the nation's most progressive states, meaning they're likely to lean progressive too. 
Breaking the court up wouldn't really make it less liberal, though. But doing it now could create an entirely new circuit with more judges who could be nominated by a Republican president, in theory balancing out the liberal tilt of the ninth. Now, President Trump doesn't have that power, but Congress does, and they've been trying to for decades. The first efforts to break up the Ninth Circuit date back to 1941, and the idea gets fresh attention every time the court makes a particularly controversial decision. I talked to Brian Fitzpatrick, a law professor at Vanderbilt University, who testified in front of a House panel on why the court should be split up. He said because the court's so big, its decisions can be inconsistent. There's only three judges here in any given case. Sometimes the panels are not good at keeping track of what all the other three judge panels are doing because there's so many of them. And so you get some inconsistent rulings, which of course makes it very hard for the people who live in the Western United States to know what is legal and what's not legal. He also said the size of the court makes it inefficient. In 2016, it had 11,305 filings. It takes more than 15 months for a case to make it through the Ninth Circuit, about four months longer than any other circuit. This all contributes to a particularly high number of decisions from the Ninth Circuit being reversed by the Supreme Court. That's the issue Republicans use to attack the court as too partisan. The Ninth Circuit decides thousands of cases every year. They're only reversed two or three times per thousand case cases they decide. But that reversal rate, two or three times per thousand cases, is much higher than any other circuit. But Trump endorsing the proposal probably isn't the way to get it done. It actually could backfire, because there are some pretty good nonpartisan reasons to break up the Ninth Circuit. And making it a partisan fight obscures those reasons. The Greek government just slashed its economic growth projections as it lists towards another recession. That will likely mean new austerity measures and steeper taxes in a country already crippled by debt nearly twice the size of its GDP. But even in the middle of a financial crisis, one sector is thriving. The historic Greek shipping industry, whose $84 billion fleet is the largest in the world. And that's due in no small part to massive tax exemptions enshrined in the Greek constitution. Phoebe Greenwood reports from Athens. Greece has 638 shipping companies, most of which are family owned. Nikos Vernikos is head of one of the richest shipping families in Greece. He's a philanthropist, a patron of the arts, and like most ship owners, one of the few Greek employers still able to offer jobs despite years of economic crisis. I am a happiness distributor. Happiness distributor, yes. I can see that. Has there been any impact on the shipping industry from the financial crisis in Greece? No, because Greek-owned shipping is active internationally, so we are not influenced by what's going on financially. The impact we have is that our heart and our soul, because we cannot enjoy life when we see so many compatriots of us suffering. But the profits of Greek shipping companies aren't subject to corporation tax. What the shipping industry does pay is wrapped up in tonnage tax laws, a system so couched in exemptions that tax contributions are nominal. By way of example, Dinagas Partners posted $66 million in net profits in 2016. If they were obliged to pay Greek corporation tax, it would be around $19 million. Instead, they pay just 0.5% of profits in tonnage tax. Ships under the age of six don't pay tonnage tax. In 2016, Greeks were the number one buyers in the global ship market. 
So new ships equals no tax. And those in shipping don't just benefit from corporate tax exemptions. The ship owners themselves are exempt from personal income tax. Shareholders of Greek shipping companies aren't subject to tax on their dividends nor capital gains. And Greek shipping families pay no inheritance tax. For a country $300 billion in debt to the European Union, every lost cent matters. There is no complaint from the Greek population about the tax status of the Greek shipping industry. Fortunately, the Greek governments don't interfere with the way the Greek ship owners act. But do you think it's a bit of a crazy situation where there's an industry that has to give its consent in order to be taxed by its government? In Greece, there is no stability. So if these tax laws were affecting the Greek shipping company, which would have as a consequence losing our credibility, no one is going to use a Greek water taxi to transport its goods. They're going to go to other taxes. Critics say the country's ship owners are holding the nation to ransom. Tax us more and we'll leave, taking our jobs and investment with us. Some argue shipping magnates are even overstating the value of their industry to add weight to that threat. Ada Psara is an investigative journalist with a leading left-wing newspaper who's reported extensively on corruption in the Greek shipping industry. If you speak to some of the people living in villages in islands like Chios, they'll say, leave them alone. They're giving us jobs. They pay us better than any other industry when there's mass unemployment. So please don't do anything that is going to scare away these ship owners and we'll lose our jobs and all these villagers are going to lose their income that are dependent on the shipping industry. What would you say to these people? Greek shipping directly or indirectly employs 200,000 Greeks. In Cardamala, a village on Chios that's home to a number of the richest shipping families, loyalty is to the ship owners that employ them rather than the government whose taxes could drive these employers away. Bottom is a gender-fluid garage punk duo that released its much-anticipated second album, Pageant, on Friday. It also may be a band on the verge of a colossal flameout. The day before the album release, an anonymous accuser tweeted that band member Ben Hopkins was a serial sexual predator behind multiple assaults. Power Bottom has called the allegations shocking, but the band hasn't denied the charges or replied to Vice News' request for comment. Meanwhile, one of Power Bottom's backing musicians says he believes the charges, and the band has been dropped from its label. Dexter Thomas has more. Power Bottom is one of those groups like Public Enemy or Pussy Riot that's more than just a band. Ben Hopkins and Liv Bruce make pretty good punk music, but it's their politics that make them special. Uh, if everyone could please just be respectful of everyone else's bodies in space, not hurt each other and be shitty, and if anyone feels unsafe in any way, I will fucking fix that shit real fast. <laughs> One of the first accusations was that Ben Hopkins had sexually assaulted a partner while she was sleeping. And since then, more people have come out with similar stories. There haven't been any legal charges yet, but now an entire music scene is imploding. Before this, Power Bottom was a media darling, as the representatives of a pretty diverse queer music scene. I interviewed Ben and Liv a couple months ago and asked them what they thought about that. At a certain point, people are saying, here is the queer rock band. We're not the queer band. We're one of thousands of queer bands. and. We're not the first anything. 
and um, and we're not heroes who are saving the world. We make tons of mistakes too, just like everybody else. And there's, there's no, no this is an unproblematic phase. Yeah, there's like, no there's no Saint Power Bottom. No. These are criminal allegations. And if they're true, Power Bottom comes off as hypocritical. But from the scene's perspective, that's not really the issue here. It's the Power Bottom let down so many of its fans. Having a band that talked about safe spaces at shows and that demanded gender neutral bathrooms at venues was powerful. For a lot of people, just being at a Power Bottom show made them feel validated. And precisely because there aren't a lot of queer bands in the mainstream spotlight, Ben and Liv were heroes. Late last week, President Trump floated the idea of canceling the daily White House press briefing for good. The suggestion seems almost reasonable. The briefing room was once the beating heart of serious American journalism and access to it was reserved for the most respected players in the field. But today, having a West Wing press pass might simply mean that you're someone who writes nice things about Donald Trump. Someone like Lucian Wintrich, a 28-year-old blogger for a site called Gateway Pundit, who now has daily access to the White House. I think a lot of the, the other uh, correspondents, they uh, report as poorly as they dress terrible ties, like uh, Macy's um, discount uh, rack ties. Uh, incredible sheens to them. I don't like ties with, uh, that are very shiny. I think those are very obnoxious. I'm Lucian Wintrich. I'm the White House correspondent for the Gateway Pundit, the, uh, the largest political uh, news website in the Midwest. Technically, I'm not supposed to be smoking. Originally, I made a name for myself through a series of relatively homoerotic photos of uh, Twinkie boys in Make America Great Again hats. Before this position, I was uh, actually a uh, creative at an advertising firm. I had gone on the news and expressed my feelings that Donald Trump was the most pro-gay candidate. Shortly after that, my employer called me to his office. He said, we think you'd be better suited or happier um, following your other interests. A month after that, I threw the first ever conservative art show. This is the new punk, Republican is the new cool. And then a month after that, I, I was asked if I wanted to start covering the White House. I have a feeling they would strangle me if I actually sat down. Um, I think uh, the vast majority of new media that has recently gained entry to the White House is is somewhat controversial only to the old guard media. I definitely think that the White House is supportive of our presence in the briefing room because there, there is such a, a clear bias with a lot of these traditional old media folk. And very frequently I will overhear them disparaging uh, the press secretary, disparaging Trump before the briefing even starts. And so to add diversity of opinion and youth <laughs> To the, uh, to the briefing room, it is, or it has been rather, applauded by the administration. Are we, at that point, like very big chances, well, or no? We'll see what pans out in the negotiations. But I think not sure that Can I just... I have not yet asked a question during the briefing. I've had a couple good ones, but uh, both those days, unfortunately, I wasn't called on. They don't really have a, I don't know, idiot's guide to being a White House correspondent book available. We're not making propaganda, we're fairly reporting. We're doing what uh, the vast majority of other journalists in that room should have been doing from the beginning. Yeah, the first paragraph needs to draw peep, draw readers in, ideally be somewhat sensationalist, and then uh, actually get to the, the details and the facts of the, of the report. In the near future, I do want to get more involved in interviews which require, I think I, I personally I think they're, they're pretty engaging, especially if I can land some big names. My first question for Trump would be, how do you put up with the incredible narrative against this administration that we really haven't seen in history? So I'd, yeah, I'd, I'd tell him, don't worry, I'm, I'm not one of them. I, I uh, was a supporter of this administration from the beginning and I will continue to support the administration. I just I'd love to see some of those campaign promises uh, being fulfilled and conservative policy being cranked out of, uh, of your office.
That's Vice News Tonight for Monday, May 15th, 